All right. Hello and good day, everyone. My name is Can. I'm here with Linkso, and we are back with another class on this fine Wednesday afternoon. Today we have Getting to Know Your Soil uh, by Master Gardeners Nancy Kruberg and Nick Landolfi. And they are both um, really, really into soil. You'll see that there are two parts to this class. So this is the first part. And the second part will be on the, on the uh, second Wednesday of next month. So look forward to that. Um, Nancy is a master gardener and a master composter, and Nick is a master gardener, and he specializes in soil. So without further ado, I will turn it over to them. So welcome, Nancy and Nick. Great. Thanks so much, Can. Um, as Can said, I am a master gardener, and I am part of the soil specialist group, which we do a lot of research on soils and try to figure out great ways to introduce it to the public, and you will see some of that today. And I also work on the Speakers Bureau. Nick? Hi. I'm Nick Landolfi. I'm a master gardener and a soil specialist also. I'm also in charge of training for the new master gardeners for the um, San Mateo and San Francisco counties for 2022. Great. Um, Kelly, if you can go back to the first slide, please. Thanks. Um, welcome to Getting to Know Your Soil. This is our two-part series on soil, and thank you to Lingzo Garden Materials and to CAN in particular for hosting us. Today, we will be going over the physical properties of soil and giving you ways to get to know your own soil at home by performing simple tests. In part two, which will be on October 13th, we will build on this talk about how soil life and chemistry influence how your soil functions. On both days, we will give you strategies for testing your soil, as well as building and maintaining healthy soils in your own yards. Please keep in mind that the soil is a very complex system that changes constantly. We will be sharing with you the fundamentals, but know that there is so much to it. We hope that you get inspired to learn more. Since this is a Master Gardener presentation, let's answer this question. What is the UC Master Gardener program? The UC Master Gardener program is a public service and outreach program under the University of California Division of Agricultural and Natural Resources, administered locally by participating UC Cooperative Extension County offices. Master Gardeners are volunteers trained by UC specialists who are involved in current research and education in their areas of expertise. As representatives of UC, we provide research-based gardening information to home gardeners and community organizations in San Mateo and San Francisco counties. Some examples of our programs and projects are a helpline, plant clinics, gardening education centers, seminars, and demonstration gardens, as well as plant sales. If you would like further information, our San Mateo and San Francisco Master Gardener website URL is listed right here. Now, just so we can get to know you a little bit better, please let us know about your knowledge of soil. When the poll comes up on your screen, please click on the response that describes you the best. Then click on the submit button. This is completely anonymous, so don't worry about your name being shared. All right, you should be seeing the poll now. All right, I think we'll end the poll. Can, can you do that? Wonderful. 
Okay, so it looks like um, a lot of you are kind of beginners at this and a few of you have uh, some moderate knowledge of it. So I think you'll all get a lot out of today's class. Thank you so much for, for participating in that survey. All right, so today Nick and I will go over the significance of soil health, followed by the basic makeup of soil and how soil forms. This will be followed by a series of slides on soil texture and structure. We will then take questions from chat that pertain to this section. So if you think of things as Nick is talking, just put them in the chat um, and Cam will be monitoring that and will be asking questions later. Then I will talk to you about water and soil, how soil gets degraded or compacted, solutions for managing compaction, and about the special situation in urban and suburban soils. After this talk today, you will be able to go home and perform some simple tests on your soil to learn more about what kind of soil you have and know a little bit more about how it functions. Now I will turn you over to Nick. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy and I uh, want to thank you for your attention and time today. Now let's talk about soil. In the past, Many believe that soil was an inert substance that simply provided support and some nutrition for plants. It was felt that an important, uh, appropriate strategy for successful gardening or farming was to add chemicals that provided abundant nutrition to the plant. But this is a flawed strategy. Under the appropriate conditions, healthy soil is more than capable of providing all the nutrition for vigorous plant growth. If you think about it, this is obvious. No one fertilizes forests or meadows, yet these thrive under the appropriate environmental conditions. No synthetic fertilizer addition is necessary for these to flourish. This is because healthy soil provides all the nutrition required and is itself a key participant in the entire ecosystem. This next slide shows the significance of healthy soil. It's based upon the fact that photosynthesis equals life. Anything that you, and in fact, any living creature, has consumed is either a direct result of photosynthesis or has itself been sustained by photosynthesis. Soil supports photosynthesis by supporting healthy plant growth. Healthy plants efficiently photosynthesize. It is worth mentioning that under non-natural conditions, soil does require maintenance to maintain its health. This is not the case for the forests and the meadows I have mentioned, but it certainly is the case in our farmlands, landscapes, and vegetable gardens. And what you learn in this series will help you increase and maintain the health of your soil. What exactly is soil? Soil is at the interface of three physical and one biological component. The physical components are the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. The lithosphere is the rigid outermost shell of the earth, the crust, and it supplies the mineral portion of the soil. The atmosphere, the air, is the gaseous envelope that surrounds the earth and provides oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide that permeates healthy soil. Nitrogen is the most abundant gas in the, in the atmosphere. And as you will learn in more detail in part two, it is an essential plant nutrient. However, plants cannot excess nitrogen from the atmosphere. It must be, must be processed or fixed by bacteria, either living free in the soil or living symbiotically in the nodules attached to the roots of plants, mostly legumes. As I have mentioned, we will talk more about this in part two. The hydrosphere is all the water that exists on Earth in gaseous, solid, and liquid forms. And while almost 97% of the, 
of the Earth's liquid water is contained in the ocean. Over two thirds of that remaining water resides in the Earth's soil. These three physical components, the lithosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere, combined with the biosphere, which is all the currently alive organisms that inhabit the soil, along with any material from that which was once alive, essentially all the organic material, is what constitutes soil. When these four components are in the appropriate proportions, you have healthy soil. The pie chart on the next slide represents the ideal percentages of each of these four components in a healthy soil. You may be surprised to learn that air and water in essentially equal proportions composed about half of a healthy soil. The air and water occupy what are referred to as pore spaces of the soil, which is that area not occupied by the other components, the mineral particles and the organic material. About 5% of healthy soil is composed of organic material with about 10% of that, or about 0.5% of the total, being soil organisms that are currently alive. An equivalent percentage consists of roots, and the remainder is organic material or debris that was once alive, referred to as humus. Mineral particles make up a little less than half of an ideal soil. The next slide diagrammatically depicts the cross section of a healthy soil. The organic material and mineral components bind together in what is referred to as aggregates. Thus, healthy soil consists of mineral particle organic material aggregates, with the pore spaces between the aggregates being occupied by air and water, as shown here. Now let's briefly focus on mineral particles and where they come from. The next slide shows the creation of soil, which is referred to as pedogenesis. Pedogenesis involves a variety of processes over a very long period of time. It begins with the physical weathering of parent rock material due to exposure to these elements, wind, rain, hail, heat, cold, ice. There is a sequential breakdown over time into smaller pieces. In addition to physical weathering, there is degradation due to chemical and biological processes. This results in the formation of silt, sand, and in the presence of oxide and silica, clay. These are the three basic components of the mineral, mineral particles in soil. Combined with mineral nutrients liberated from the parental rock material and any organic material present, the result is soil. I want to emphasize that this takes an enormously long time. This next slide shows small scale pedogenesis in action. This is a rock that is at our garden education center. It is on the ground and completely exposed to sun, rain, wind, heat, and cold. Over time, this exposure will result in small cracks in the parent rock that will be infiltrated by water, which will then expand and contract based on temperature fluctuations. You can see the rock has been colonized by lichen, which is a combination of fungi and algae. The lichen will produce organic acids that will slowly degrade the rock. The lichen will also provide a receptive environment for other organisms, which will in turn excrete organic products that also degrade the rock. This is referred to as biological weathering. If this rock were to stay here undisturbed and exposed to these elements for centuries, it would degrade to the basic soil particles, sand, silt, and clay and in combination with the organic material around would become soil. The next slide lists the two 
distinct definable physical characteristics of soil. Soil texture is defined by the relative proportions of sand, silt, and clay that make up the mineral portion of the soil. It is very difficult to change the soil texture at scale in nature. Of course, you can modify soil texture in a pot or an isolated raised bed, but the scale of the additions needed to modify texture in a large area makes this impractical. Another basic characteristic of soil is soil structure. Soil structure refers to the arrangement or organization of these soil particles into aggregates and the resulting pores and channels that form between these aggregates. It is relatively easy to modify soil structure. The next slide shows the three basic mineral components of soil, sand, silt, and clay. The left half of the slide shows these components magnified with the level of magnification for each indicated below. It is important to appreciate that these components differ drastically in their size. The figure on the right demonstrates this visually. There can be a 1000 fold difference between the largest sand particle and the smallest clay particle. This significant size difference has important implications for soil texture. The next slide. You now know that soil texture is defined by the proportion of sand, silt, and clay in the soil. These components have the following characteristics. Sand feels gritty. It has large pore spaces. Silt feels slippery. It has medium pore spaces. Clay feels sticky and has tiny pore spaces. The pore spaces for sand and um, clay are shown at the bottom half of this figure. And while not to scale, I think you can appreciate the difference. It is also important to note that the surface area of these particles varies dramatically. In an equivalent amount of material, clay will have approximately 180,000 times the surface area of the same amount of sand. This drastic difference in surface area has important implications for water holding capacity and the fertility of the soil. And we will discuss this more in part two of this series. The next slide introduces you to the soil texture triangle. There are 12 textural classes of soil based on the relative percentages of sand, silt, and clay. These textural classes are indicated by the different colors on the triangle. Soils composed primarily of sand and silt and lower amounts of clay are referred to as loams. You can have your soil analyzed by a commercial lab to determine its textural class. You provide a sample, it will be exposed to extremely high temperature to remove all moisture and organic material, and the relative percentages of sand, silt, and clay will be determined. However, there are a couple of simple tests that you can carry out to determine the texture of your soil. The next slide shows the soil ribbon test. The soil ribbon test will give you a rough estimate of soil texture. You obtain a golf ball size amount of soil, wet it until it is just pliable. Try to roll the soil into a ball. If it will not maintain the shape of a ball, it is predominantly sand. Use your thumb to press the soil out over your index finger in the form of a ribbon. Notice the feel of the ribbon. Is it gritty, indicative of sand, slippery, indicating silt, or sticky, signifying clay? Observe the length of the ribbon before it breaks away. A ribbon that breaks away before reaching 2.5 centimeters or about an inch 
is a sandy loam. A ribbon between 2.5 and 5 centimeters long, or 1 to 2 inches, indicates a clay loam. And a ribbon greater than 5 centimeters, or 2 inches, is a predominantly clay soil. The address on the slide directs you to a video with more detailed instructions for carrying out this test yourself. The next slide shows another test that can provide a more accurate determination of soil texture. This is the soil sedimentation test. Obtain about a cup of soil, remove any large rocks, sticks, roots, and other organic material. Put the soil into a quart mason jar, fill it with water, and shake vigorously to dissolve all soil clumps. Allow the jar to sit undisturbed for a minimum of 24 hours, allowing the soil components to settle. Sand will settle to the bottom quickly, with silt settling as the middle layer, somewhat slower, and clay settling on top. Allowing the sample to settle for a few days or longer can provide more clearly defined labor, layers. Then measure each layer and determine the relative percentage of each component by dividing the height of each layer by the sum of the heights of all three layers. Accurately defining the layer boundaries can be sometimes difficult as shown in the three examples on this slide. And for that reason, some prefer to measure the sand layer 60 seconds post shaking, the silt layer two hours later, and the clay layer 48 hours after that. Adding a tablespoon of powdered dishwasher detergent can also enhance the layer boundaries. The address on this slide directs you to a video with more detailed instructions for carrying out this test yourself. On the next slide, you can see that once you have determined the relative percentage of each component using the soil sedimentation test, you can use the soil texture triangle to determine the textural class of your soil. In this particular example, we have determined that the sample is 25% sand, 40% silt, and 35% clay. Draw a line at each of these specific percentages on the triangle. The intersection of these lines indicates the textural class of the sample soil. In this example, the soil is a clay loam. Now let's talk about soil structure. If you take a mineral soil with a defined texture, and add organic material to it, for example, compost, you will end up with a soil that has structure. The next slide answers the question, what exactly is soil structure? Soil structure is the spatial arrangement of soil particles into aggregates of various sizes and the resulting pores and channels between these aggregates. This slide attempts to represent soil structure. On the left, you can see sand, silt, and clay particles, along with organic material, aggregated together with pores throughout. The right panel shows an actual sample of soil with good structure. You can see multiple roots, some of the larger pores, and even an earthworm, worm, an unequivocal indication of healthy soil. What causes soil to aggregate? It turns out the products of microorganisms living in the soil mediate soil aggregation. Microorganisms in the soil secrete products of their metabolism that act as glues to bind soil components and organic material into aggregates of various sizes. Pores form between these aggregates and these pores allow both air and water to infiltrate the soil. Plant roots can easily penetrate soil that is well aggregated. 
This slide depicts the difference between a well-structured and poorly structured soil. The poorly structured soil on the laurel right has minimal aggregation and very few pores. Water and air filtration are limited. The well-structured soil on the upper left has many large aggregates and good porosity, which allows both air and water infiltration and easier root penetration. Frequently, it is possible to assess soil structure visually. This slide shows three samples with different structures. The one on the right has poor structure, few roots, limited aggregation. The center panel shows a good soil structure. You can see several roots and the soil has a richer color, indicating more organic material and moisture than the sample on the right. The panel on the left has excellent structure. You can see multiple roots, good aggregation, and it is dark with organic material and moisture. Soil aggregation can be assessed by a water stability test, also referred to as a slate test. Select a clump of soil, allow it to dry, then gently submerge it into water. Poor soil with minimal Mineral aggregation will rapidly dissolve, will rapidly fall apart, while healthy soil with significant aggregation will largely remain intact. The stability of the soil aggregate in water is due to those biological glues which bind the soil particles into aggregates. The lack of these biological glues in a soil with poor structure allows that soil to easily dissolve in water. The result of this test can be quite striking. And I would like to show you a short video on the next slide. This test is being carried out by Roar Archuleta. Nancy will provide more background on Mr. Archuleta shortly, but as you will see, he is a very enthusiastic soil scientist. The diagnostic tools that I know of is the soil stability test. Here are two soils, exactly the same soil type. This soil has been tilled for 30 years. This soil has not been tilled for 40 years. It is covered with diverse plants year round. Watch what happens when we drop the soil in the water. Notice how the conventional till soil is falling apart. The biotic glues in the organic matter are burned up by tillage. The soil pores have collapsed. Notice the no-till soil. The pore spaces are still intact. Do this test for yourself. I guarantee if you dig a little, you'll learn a lot. One of the, the best visual diagnostics. The next slide shows that the size. This slide shows that the size and quality of a root ball of a plant is also an indication of a well structured soil. Here, the plant on the right has been grown in poorly structured soil. That root ball is clearly inferior to the root ball of the plant on the left, which has been grown in a well-structured soil. Before I end, I would like to emphasize this point. Soil texture and soil structure need to be considered collectively. Texture alone cannot define soil health. It is important to realize that you can have two soils with the identical texture, that is the identical percentage of sand, silt, and clay. But if one has little or no organic material and the other is rich in organic material, the former will have a poor structure and thus relatively poor soil health, while the latter will possess a healthy soil structure and significantly increased fertility due to the presence of a considerable organic 
component. Organic material is the key to maintaining healthy soil. Remember, texture alone does not provide insight into the health of the soil. Finally, I would like to show you a real life example of this. This past Saturday, I was planting seedlings, uh, broccoli seedlings from a four inch pot into a raised bed that I have here at home. I removed a single trowel full of soil and was surprisingly pleased at how many earthworms were revealed by this minor disruption. You can see most of them here, but the next slide has them highlighted. Nearly a dozen in a very small area. If you observe something similar to this, you can be confident your soil is healthy. I can now take any questions specific to this section. Okay, so there are a couple questions here, Nick. Um, one of them is, I'm just gonna go in a random order here. Um, what can we generally do or add to clay soil to improve it? Uh, in general, organic material is the best, um, the best addition. Clay soil, um, oftentimes people feel they have clay soil based on uh, sort of gross observation of how it behaves. But it's really important to do uh, something like the sedimentation test. And I think you'll be surprised to find that uh, the percentage of clay you have um, may be much lower than uh, you might think. In fact, a, a general answer, how to improve soil, add organic material. You're going to improve the structure. You're going to improve the fertility. You're going to improve the water retention. The addition of organic material is important. Okay. And here's the fun question. What's the difference between soil and earth? That is a fun question. I would say <laughs> earth encompasses any part of the lithosphere, the Earth's crust. And that could be broken down into healthy soil or dirt, not so healthy soil. So I guess it's sort of an over, over in, well, basically it's the Earth. Whereas soil, I think, has a little more um, biology inherent in it. Okay, I think that that'll do it for the questions for this section. Okay, I will turn it over to Nancy. Great, thanks so much, Nick. And I apologize, we, we do not know why all these little boxes are popping up. We practiced this at least three times and it never happened till today. So <laughs> hopefully we'll have fewer and fewer as we go along. Anyway, thank you, Nick. You did a great job on the top part and I'm gonna add on to what Nick did. So now that you know about soil structure, Let's look more closely to notice how water enters, flows through, and is held in soil, as well as ways that um, these processes may be inhibited. Also, please note that what is happening with water in soil is part of a bigger picture, which we know as the water cycle. Healthy soil is part of a healthy, functioning water cycle. On the next slide, we will look at how air and water flow through or are held in well-structured soil and the opposite, which is compacted soil. So let's look at the diagram on the left. All of the dark and light brown shapes are representing aggregates. The white spaces show air and the purple shows water clinging or adhering to aggregates and being held in some pore spaces. This shows a soil that is well aggregated or has good structure where air and water easily flow through while some water is held for later use. Notice that in a well structured soil, there is a good balance of air and water. Please also note that water 
tightly adhering to aggregates, which happens particularly when there was a lot of clay and in some very tiny pore spaces are not available to plant roots. In healthy soil systems where plants form mycorrhizas or relationship with fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi can get to that water and send it back to the plant roots. This picture shows roots which are thicker and the mycorrhizal fungi which are much thinner and appear cloud-like in this photo. We will look at these as well as other types of fungi and their relationships to plants a bit more next month. Now let's look at the diagram on the right. This shows what happens to soil that has been compacted. Notice that both soils have the same amount of aggregates, but when soil is compacted, the pore spaces diminish significantly and air and water flow is impeded. Conversely, when soil is well structured, it expands because there are more pore spaces. In other words, there is more air in the soil. Notice the pie charts on top of both diagrams. There is more air in the well structured soil. Your job, if the soil is compacted, is to help the microbes build structure. When they build soil structure, the number of pore spaces increases. The volume of the compacted soil expands due to the increase in pore spaces. So let's say the diagram on the right represents, say, a cubic foot of soil. When the soil structure improves and more pore spaces are present, you may have around one and a half cubic feet of soil all from that extra air from the pore spaces. Let's now look at how water functions over time in well-structured soil. When there is rain or you have just irrigated, the soil becomes saturated. That means for a short time, there's no air in the soil as all the pores are filled with water. Gravity then pulls some of the water farther down into the soil. And now there are pore spaces with air as well as pore spaces with water. This is known as field capacity. Plants are able to function and take up the available water in this situation. When most water has drained or has been used by the plants, there is no longer water available to plants. We say that this is the wilting point. When the soil is at the wilting plant point, sorry, the, the plants wilt and cannot recover. And this is different from when plants wilt at the end of a very hot day and are fully recovered by morning. Think about this process when you irrigate. You want to irrigate before your soil reaches the wilting point. Before we move on, let's take a moment to understand the difference between the words infiltration and percolation. Infiltration is referring to water entering the soil surface. Percolation is referring to water moving within the soil. If soil is not crusted on top, is well structured, and has no compaction within the soil profile, then water will infiltrate into the soil surface and percolate through the soil pores. When water has percolated into the soil, it is now called groundwater. Some groundwater will be held in the soil in those pores that we've talked about and onto organic matter, etc. And the rest will either enter creeks or fill aquifers. Nick spoke to you about soil texture. Your soil texture is the main determinant for how water will flow or percolate through your soil. These two pictures show how water infiltrates and percolates into two types of soil textures. This happens whether this is a rain event or you have just run your irrigation. On the left, you can see how water behaves in a sandy soil. It infiltrates very quickly and drains almost straight down due to gravity and the large pore spaces in the sand. You remember those pictures of those sand particles are pretty large. So therefore the pore spaces are large. 
The picture on the right shows how water infiltrates and percolates in a more clay type soil. In clay soil with those very small pore spaces, water tends to infiltrate and percolate in the soil profile very slowly and then spreads due to capillary action. Capillary action is like what you see when water is drawn up into a paper towel. It is important to know how water moves through your garden soil so you can plan your irrigation setup and timing appropriately. We have talked a bit now about how water moves through different types of soil, how water moves through soil after it rains, and looked briefly at what happens to pores in a compacted soil. But why are we talking so much about how water percolates through your soil? What are the benefits of having good soil structure where water infiltrates and percolates well? Well, first, soil can be a reservoir for water. Did you know that more water is held in the soil than in all the freshwater lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and creeks? Soil that is well structured really holds on to water in those pore spaces. It also is held tightly by clay and organic matter. Well structured soil in our home gardens and farms is important, especially in drought prone areas like California. With well-structured soil, we can use much less water as water stays where your plants can use it instead of running off the surface or draining quickly away beyond the plant roots. Healthy living soil cleans water of pollutants. The microbial life, which functions best in moist soil, sees everything as food. So they can break down many toxins into non-toxic elements and organic matter can bind onto toxins and render them inert. Water moving through the soil recharges aquifers. That means that wells will be active, not dried up. And there will be no subsidence or lowering of the land due to depleted aquifers as we see currently in the Central Valley of California. Water that percolates through soil moves through underground passageways rather than over the land to enter creeks, which prevents loss of topsoil due to erosion. And our creeks, streams, and rivers stay clear. So how well does water drain through your soil? You can do this simple percolation test at home in your own yard. Water draining too fast or too slow may not be the best for the plants you are growing. This do-it-yourself test is commonly used, but we are showing you pictures and descriptions from the Tennessee State University Cooperative Extension, since we think the pictures and words are very clear. Step one, dig a hole approximately 12 meters in diameter or 12 meters deep. That would be 30 by 30 centimeters if you're um, visiting here from another country. And make sure it has pretty straight sides. If you're testing your entire property, dig several holes scattered around your yard since drainage can vary from place to place. Step two, fill the hole with water and let it sit overnight. This saturates the soil and helps give a more accurate test reading. Step three, refill the hole with water the next day. Step four, measure drainage every hour. Measure the water level by laying a stick, pipe, or other straight edge across the top of the hole. Then use a tape measure or yardstick to determine the water level. Continue to measure the water level every hour until the hole is empty, noting the number of inches or centimeters the water level drops per hour. The ideal soil drainage is around two inches or six centimeters per hour with readings between one to three inches, which is generally okay for plants that have average drainage needs. If the rate is less than one inch or three centimeters per hour, 
your drainage is too slow and you'll need to improve it by adding organic matter and plants to create better soil structure or choose plants tolerant of wet soil. If drainage is more than four to six inches or 10 to 15 centimeters per hour, it's too fast. Add organic matter and plants to slow the water down or choose plants that prefer drier soil. Now that we've covered percolation, let's look a bit at infiltration. Remember that infiltration is looking at how water enters soil. This slide shows how water infiltrates depending on soil texture. Remember the soil texture triangle that Nick showed you? As a quick review, the percent of sand is shown on the bottom, the percent of clay is shown on the left, and the percent of silt is shown on the right. On this slide, notice the column on the left. It shows the different rates at which water will infiltrate into different soil types. This is for a well-functioning soil that is not crusted or compacted at the surface. Notice that blue means that water can infiltrate into your soil very quickly. And you see the blue color on the lower left of the triangle. Do you remember what kind of soil texture would be in that corner? Yes, those are the sandier soil and water enters very quickly. Now notice the maroon color at the very top of the triangle. In this type of soil texture, water infiltrates slowly. Do you remember what kind of soil texture is at the top of this triangle that would make it enter slowly? Yes, those are the more clay type soils. In the bottom right where you see the green color, which means that water infiltrates at a more medium rate, what soil texture would be found there? Yes, those are the siltier soil types. Your soil texture really matters. However, even though you cannot change your soil texture in any practical way, unless it's in a pot or maybe a raised bed, you can improve your soil structure and thereby improve the way your water infiltrates and percolates into soil by adding organic matter and having living plants in your system. If you are curious and have the time and want to gather materials, you can do a do-it-yourself water infiltration test. There are several sources on the internet. I'm not gonna go into depth, but the basics are that you have a six inch or 15 centimeter diameter ring that you pound in the ground. Then you put about an inch or three centimeters of water in and see how long the water takes to infiltrate. Now, let's look at soil that has degraded, meaning that it has lost its structure and is compacted. The background picture here is an example. Please notice all the puddling. Water is not able to infiltrate in those spots. Ray Archuleta, formerly with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, has had a career helping farmers as a soil scientist and consultant. To describe degraded soil, he has said that the soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. What exactly does this mean? Well, let's move on and we shall see. First, let's look at how people inadvertently destroy structure in their soils at home. They do this by excessive tilling and digging, by foot traffic, leaving soil bare, using biocides, meaning insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, by using synthetic fertilizers. And now we can go on and look more closely at each of these practices and how it affects the soil. But before we leave this slide, please notice the weeds in this photo on the right. Why are they there? They are starting to repair the damaged soil. That is nature's way. So excessive digging or tilling. 
Though digging and tilling is seen in the natural world with the work of creatures like earthworms, ants, and gophers as they aerate the soil, it is different than the excessive tilling that can happen in agricultural systems and sometimes in our own home gardens. Do you remember all those double dig days? Some of you might. Some digging is fine to put a plant in place or to prepare a new bed for planting. But let's look at this practice more closely to see how it really affects the soil. Through digging and tilling, an excessive amount of air is added and it wakes up a lot of aerobic bacteria. These bacteria rapidly consume the organic matter in the soil and also the glues that help the aggregates stay together. The result is that aggregates fall apart and carbon is sent into the air as carbon dioxide. The release of carbon dioxide is the byproduct of the respiration from the bacteria busily consuming the organic matter. The loss of carbon in the soil means less food for other microbes and plants. Also, fungi, which are an important component of aggregate formation, are torn apart. We will learn more about bacteria and fungi in relation to aggregate formation in October. When organic matter diminishes, we can say that the soil is hungry. Foot traffic. When you have foot traffic, pathways can form where plants cannot grow, pore spaces collapse, and water cannot infiltrate or percolate. When water cannot infiltrate or enter the soil, nor percolate deep within the soil profile, we can say that the soil is thirsty. Leaving the soil bare. This is when we can say that the soil is naked. Bare soil gets compacted by raindrops and sometimes overhead irrigation. Yes, when water drops on bare soil, it hits really hard. When plants are in place, their leaves and stems slow the water down so it lands softly on the ground below. When soil is left bare, it is open to wind and water erosion. Water cannot infiltrate through the surface, so cannot percolate through the soil profile. Bare soil gets much hotter than plant covered soil. The high temperatures stress the plant and growth slows. And the higher soil temperature is not good for our, our already warming planet. This is when we can say that the soil is running a fever. Using biocides, meaning insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc., there may be a time when you will need to resort to these, but always use them judiciously and never use more than the label recommends. Using biocides creates a decline in the diversity of living organisms, which in turn limits nutrient cycling. Using synthetic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers do feed your plants particular nutrients directly, but it limits the relationships between the plant and the microbial community in the soil, which also disrupts natural nutrient cycling. An alternative would be amendments that feed microbial life. More about microbes and nutrient cycling next month. Long-term use of synthetic fertilizers discourages the natural relationship that occur between the plant roots and living organisms. Small amounts of fertilizers may be needed sometimes, but use with care. When we rely only on synthetic fertilizers to feed plants, the soil life goes hungry. In summary, soil that compacts is naked when you leave the soil bare without living plants or plant residue, creating limited infiltration and allowing wind and water to take away topsoil. Is hungry when it loses organic matter and microbial diversity. Is thirsty when soil loses structure and water fails to infiltrate or percolate and runs a fever when left bare for the sun to beat down on it and heat it up. 
you might ask yourself how you can test your soil for compaction. If a soil professional were to test your soil, they would use this instrument on the left called a penetrometer. To use a penetrometer, one slowly pushes the probe into the soil and reads the setting on the dial. Most plant roots can penetrate into soil up to 150 pounds per square inch, or PSI, but no roots can go past 300 PSI. To use the penetrometer, push the probe in until it reads about 300 PSI. Then put a hand on the probe at the soil surface, pull it out, and measure the distance from your hand to the end of the probe. Then note the depth as the compaction occurs. Most of us do not have a penetrometer. So find a sturdy rod to push into your soil. If you have a metal one like this 3 8 inch rebar, find a place in your garden where a plant is growing well. Your soil should be moist for this to be the most successful. Push your rod into the soil until you can't push easily. This is your compaction layer. Mark the soil level on your rod with your hand and pull it out. Measure how far down it went. Was it six inches, 12 inches? Now find a place in your garden and try it next to a plant that is not doing well. How far down is it to the compaction layer there? If you are lucky, you may not even find a compaction layer. This is just another tool to get to know your soil better. There are practices that can help you avoid compaction and maintain good structure in your soil. Make sure that your soil has enough organic matter. To increase soil organic matter, you can apply compost, vermicompost, and mulch. Keep living roots in the ground using cover crops or perennial ground cover and leave the leaves on the ground to feed your soil. You don't need to cart them away. Minimize soil disturbance when soils are wet. Reduce the number of trips across an area and preferably use pathways. And never use leaf blowers on soil as they cause surface compaction. To see in action what we have been talking about this afternoon, please enjoy watching this video, which shows how water runs off or infiltrates into soils that have been managed differently, so using different practices. After this clip, I hope you can see how your gardening practices matter. My name is Charlie Forsman. We have our rain simulator set up to show how different management practices can have an impact on soil health. I have four examples prepared for our demonstration today. The first is conventional till where the soil is tilled year after year. The second is no till where we leave all the plant debris in the field and do not disturb the soil at all. The third is no till with a cover crop. So similar to no till in that we leave the plant debris on the surface and then immediately after harvest, we plant a green growing crop. And then fourth is our pollinator habitat area where we plant flowers, grasses, and shrubs to help support butterfly and bees. In our conventional tilled system, we expect the raindrop to cause a lot of surface disruption, carrying soil sedimentation and nutrients out of the field. In addition, we'll see very little water infiltrate down through the soil surface, staying in the field for the growing crop. In our no-till system, the soil surface is protected by plant debris, therefore buffering the impact of the raindrops. As a result, we see very little to no runoff. In addition, the water has a chance to infiltrate down through the soil surface and stays in the field for the growing crop. In our no-till plus cover crop example, we have plant debris left on the surface, which helps buffer the raindrops and reduce the runoff. But in addition, we have a green growing crop, which has a root structure down below ground. That root structure creates micropores and macropores for the water to infiltrate through the soil and stay in the field. In our pollinator habitat example, the soil surface is protected by plant debris. As a result, we see very little to no runoff. In addition, because this has been no-till for many years, we have earthworm activity and many microorganisms at work in the soil, creating opportunities for water infiltration. 
In summary, agronomic practices such as no-till and no-till with cover crops greatly improve our soil health. We see more earthworm activity and a friendlier environment for microbial life. In addition, we also see better soil structure, better soil porosity, which allows for better water infiltration, keeping the water in the field where the farmer needs it most. I hope you enjoyed this clip. And even though it is referring to farms, the principles are the same in your home garden. Now we're going to take a moment to consider the special needs of urban and suburban soils. Urban soils have been influenced by human activity. The following is a list of considerations when working in an urban or suburban garden. Some or all of the topsoil may have been removed or most likely have been removed before construction began on your house. The soil was graded and compacted to build your home. So there may be a compaction layer in your garden area as well. Import soil may have been brought in to raise the grade and may be a different texture. Water may not infiltrate due to differences in soil texture and compaction. In an urban setting, you should consider the past use of the land and test the soil before planting food crops and letting people and pets dig in the soil. So now let's see if you can recall some of these main ideas. See if you know the answers to these questions. You just need to think about it and we will provide the answer for you to check yourself. So the first question, what affects the movement of water through soil the most? It is your soil texture, I hope you got that. Next question, how can you improve the structure of your soil? I think you heard this one over and over. You need to add organic matter and make sure living roots are in the soil. And there's one more question. What are some ways to prevent soil compaction? There are, were lots of things we talked about. So just think about that. And hopefully you thought of a few of these. Minimize disturbance of the soil, use designated pathways, keep ground covered with plants and or mulch, and keep living roots in your soil. And our last thoughts here, go out to your garden, slow down, use your senses and get to know your garden soil. Try some of these tests we mentioned, texture, soil stability, aggregates on root balls of plants, percolation, infiltration, compaction. You can test for all those things if you're inspired. And please come back for part two on October 13th. On October 13th, we will review what you heard today and learn more about soil biology, as well as some basic chemistry and how that affects the growth of plants and how the whole system functions for the health of the planet, which includes all of us. And here is your sneak preview with the outline for getting to know your soil in part two. I hope that makes you want to come back. And then we have some resources for you. So if you want to go deeper into some subjects, you will be getting a copy of this slide set. So this will be on here. And next, I would just like to thank Lingzo Garden Materials for hosting this presentation today and to the Master Gardener Soil Specialist Group for their support in preparing this presentation. And a special thanks to Can for hosting us today on Zoom and for monitoring chat and to Kelly Torikai, a fellow Master Gardener who helped with editing our slides. And if you have questions after today, please make sure to reach out to the Master Gardener Helpline. And if you're not in this county, every county in California has, has a Master Gardener. Well, every county that has a Master Gardener program has one of these. 
All right, we'd now like to open this up to questions. So if, I'm sure you've already put a lot in the chat and can will go ahead and ask. All righty, fantastic. Thanks, Nancy. Uh -huh. So we'll go back a little bit and I'll uh, pick some of the questions here. So the first one is how often uh, should you amend your soil with compost? Would it be? So great question. Um, and it kind of depends. I usually put a little bit on every time I plant. So usually fall and spring. Um, I definitely really like to put it on in fall before everything goes dormant. And um, I always put on compost with a layer of mulch on top because if you spend a lot, well, I make my own compost and I encourage you guys to, especially when you make your own compost, it takes a lot of time and a lot of care. And I like to protect it with a, with a layer of, um, of mulch just to protect it from, um, you know, uh, drying out and killing all those wonderful microbes that you put in there. Nick, when do you do the same in your garden? Largely, I think the, um, uh, you know, the key is to do it as often as you can. If I'm planting a, um, uh, you know, seedlings from a, a four inch pod into the beds, I always toss a little bit of um, vermicompost, you know, worm castings yep. in the bottom of the hole. Um, I use shredded leaves for um, mulch in the summertime to keep the, uh, the soil covered. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you can do it as frequently as you want. Yeah. And I, and also you don't need much. Um, yes. You know, if you're doing a new bed, um, you might want to put, I don't know, four inches or so and mix it all in the top layers. But after that, you don't want to do that. You only want to put it on the top and, you know, an, an inch, maybe two inches, but, but we really don't need much. You're just kind of helping sustain all that organic matter. Yes. Remember the, um, in the ideal soil, really only about 10% or so is organic material. And that's split between living organisms and all the things that have been living in the past. So uh, you don't wanna put 50% compost um, into a pot or into your raised beds. That would be a mistake. Can you, you're muted. Interesting. Okay, there we go. Um, is the next question is, um, is organic material the same um, as compost or is it plant leaves and stems? What do you mean by organic material? Great question. It's all the above. Organic matter is all, everything that's carbon based. Anything that is alive or was once alive, that is organic matter. So yeah, you can um, you can put leaves on top. They will decompose. You know, I love compost. That's great. But there are other things, um, and you can you can even you know cut down plants and leave that on your soil to keep the soil covered as a mulch. You know, you can cut the tops off a of plant in, in the annual and leave it there. Some people do that, or some people compost them and throw them back on. There's a lots of ways, but yes, organic materials, anything that is or was once alive. Thank you. Okay, so next question is, do you recommend natural fertilizers? And if you do, is chicken manure or cow slash horse manure better? Oh, I, I'll take that first in the Nick. I'll to jump in have something. Sorry, I, I'm passionate about this stuff. So um, with manures, compost it first. That is your safest bet. And here's why. And especially if you're talking about edibles, um, there are pathogens that can be in them that, that go away with, through the composting process. And UC is very strong right now on saying do not use manures directly in your garden, but compost them first and then use them because they're, they're, they are really great. Nick, do you want to add? Um, yes, I uh, personally I use composted chicken manure um, because I use um, shredded leaves, and that's largely a carbon-heavy component. Chicken manure is largely a nitrogen-rich component, so it kind of balances it out. I always put um, at least once a year a bag of chicken manure um, on each raised bed just to take care of the leaf, provide nitrogen for degradation of the leaves. Nice. Ready. So what do you think of adding expanded clay pebbles to help clay soil with aeration? 
So I know nothing about what that is, but I'd say do it naturally um, by adding organic matter and let let the structure build. Nick, do you have any experience with that? Not really. I think that, um, you know, the, I mean, if you add, if you try to add non-organics to clay, um, you sort of have the potential to um, uh, make your make your soil mold more difficult. For example, I mean, you can get to a point where you're adding sand and you might be making something that's close to mortar or cement um, by mixing that sand in with, with the um, inherent soil you have. So by far, the best strategy is to use organic material to sort of you know, break up that clay and provide um, uh, spaces for the air and water to infiltrate and percolate. All right, so we talk a lot about organic matter. So for slow drainage, we need to add organic matter. And for fast drainage, we need to add organic matter. So is the solution the same? It is, and I'm glad you brought that up. It's exactly so. So we'll go into that just a little bit. Um, if you got, you know, your heavy clay soil, which, you know, tends to bind and clump a little more, you add organic matter and it creates those aggregates and those pore spaces. So it loosens it up. It adds that air that we need or those spaces for air and water. And with sand, as you know, you got those big sand particles and big pore spaces and water just goes swishing through it. You add organic matter to slow that water down. It's still gonna be making your aggregates and all that you want it, but, um, but it will actually slow it down because you are making those aggregates and, um, and water will hold on to the organic matter. Uh, but yeah, it's the same, same solution for both things. Nick, do you wanna to add to that? I think you pretty much covered it. It's, um, yeah, it's kind of the um, all encompassing answer. When in doubt, add organic material. Okay, so then how much organic matter or compost should people add, say, for example, to their lawns? Let's start with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really good with inches. Terry's really good with that. I don't know if you are, but, you know, again, you don't need a whole lot um, on a lawn. I'd maybe say like a half an inch or so, but I don't, I don't, I honestly am not very good with the numbers. I eyeball it. Nick, do you, are yeah. you a number oriented? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not. Definitely not an expert on lawns, but I, you know, several people simply just leave their clippings on the lawn and don't collect those. And that's sufficient to provide nitrogen, you know, as they decay, provides nitrogen um, to the soil below. Uh, yeah, if, if you absolutely. Were, if you were going to um, add compost, I would definitely do it very lightly. You know, you don't want to cover the, the grass. You basically want to um, provide some accessory organic material between the blades of the grass. So just yeah. sprinkling. And the way I've been taught is it's, you know, good idea if you, you know, want to go around and, and aerate your lawn a little, you know, pull those plugs out, then sprinkle, you know, a quarter to a half inch of compost or whatever. And then it will have a chance, especially when it's water for some of that compost to get down into the soil to feed your microbes, which are going to let, you know, let, help everything grow better. And I totally agree with Nick leave your leave your clippings on there and also you know yes we talk a lot about compost but even just keep your soil covered even if you didn't use compost but in any area you know use a use a cover crop or use some kind of perennial low growing plants that covers the soil in between some of your annuals if your annuals don't you know don't cover the soil itself yeah, absolutely. I can, you know, attest to that. It's really, if you're um, adding compost to an existing lawn, you don't want to go um, more than about a quarter of an inch and you just want to lightly sprinkle it in. The main part is water it in well. So it gets down to the roots and really provides the nutrients that it needs. Great. Thanks, um, Ken. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is, um, I've read that if you overwater plants, adding hydrogen peroxide will actually provide more oxygen. Is this a good practice to add occasionally? I have never heard of that, but I would be really skeptical. <laughs> Nick, how about you? I, yeah, I, I also have never heard of that. And, and on uh, just cursory reflection, I, I don't, I, 
the, the chemistry doesn't make sense there. Um, so yeah, I, I would probably stay away from that particular practice. I, I just let the soil dry out. Yeah, I agree. So the next question is, what amendments should we stay away from in nurseries? Say peat moss, sphagnum moss, steer manure, miracle grow soil, garden soil, potting soil, et cetera. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, like the peat, I, I just environmentally, you know, it's a slow growing commodity and everybody's saying st steer away from it um, just from the fact of that it's not easily renewable because it takes so long to do. Um, miracle Grow is, if, if you're talking about the same thing, I is, is a fertilizer. And, you know, while I can't say don't ever use fertilizer, be cautious. Um, yeah, I, I think you just need to be smart about looking at what you're buying. And you don't need a lot of stuff. If you look, if you look at a meadow, look at a forest, and see how it's managing on its own, what can we learn from that in order to manage our own spaces? And you, people want to sell you a lot of stuff. Um, and if you know, if you're, if you don't have it around, let's, you know, if you've got a very small property or whatever, and you don't have a lot to add to your, um, your garden, you might need to go get something, but keep it simple. Nick, do you want to add on? Uh, largely covered it. I mean, bottom line is look at the bag. Uh, you know, if you see a lot of um, uh, chemical names and things, uh, then, you know, regardless of what it says on the title of the bag, you're basically adding um, chemical fertilizer. Um, you want things that, uh, you know, are natural, bone meal, uh, things like that. Those are the types of things that uh, uh, you should migrate towards. And you know, the peat moss thing, it's not renewable and that's true. So it's really not a good choice, but coconut core is, you know, as good as peat moss. So um, I would just move towards that. And that's, you know, clearly renewable. All righty. So next question is with clay soils, in addition to organic matter, would you suggest adding loam to help improve as well? And they recently noticed virgin loam made available via Lingso. So I don't know Lingso's products. Um, so I don't know what they mean by virgin loam. In my world, loam is like the texture triangle that Nick showed you. It just means it's a combination of sand, silt, and clay. Um, what you really have to be careful about is not putting different textures like if you've got your regular garden soil and all of a sudden you say, oh, I want a different kind of soil and you lay it on top, then all of a sudden you've got a problem where the water doesn't want to percolate down into your other soil because two different textures, when the water comes down, it's going to stop and won't go down for a very long time. So you're going to have a water issue. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't quite know what else to say about that one. Nick? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really familiar with the loam product. Um, Cam might know. Is that the same as the vegetable mix? Just a sandy loam. So it's it's a base um, sandy loam. It's a virgin sandy loam that you use as a base soil mix for a lot of soils. You know, you still have to add organic right. matter to it. So, right, right. Um, okay. so it sounds like it'd be great in a pot. Yeah. Like using that to may, maybe, oh, maybe too yeah. heavy. I don't but, know. But yeah. sub, supplemented with organic material. It sounds like, and uh, this is um, uh, an educated guess, that, you know, this is a soil that has a texture that's relatively low in clay and relatively high in sand and silt. So um, it's a loam. I mean, that's the classical definition of a loam is something that has, I think on the texture triangle, less than 40% clay. Um, so yeah, you could use it to amend a uh, heavily clay soil with organic material also. Okay, moving on to a different question. So how can I increase worm activity in a new build construction? Improving your soil. <laughs> so I don't know what the new built instruction is. Um, 
if it's like they're just putting a new garden bed in or whether they really just did a new house and they're trying to put something in there. I'm not sure, Nick, do you want to take the first pass yeah, at this well, one? Well, I'll work under the assumption that it's a new garden bed. Okay. And again, I would, um, you know, undergo a consistent um, addition of organic material. The example I showed you, um, you know, my vegetable beds have, uh, they were extensively redone, I guess, six years ago now. And although I don't know for sure, I'm pretty certain that had I done that, you know, say, well, let's put it this way. I do not remember seeing as many worms as I did this past Saturday in the past. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly adding organic material um, to the soil. So I really think the, you know, the best strategy is just give those worms something to work on. And, um, you know, if they like it, they're going to stick around and there's going to be more of them. And I would also say, Test your soil, see what you've got there already. You know, do, do some of the things that we just talked about. Um, we're gonna give you more things to test next month uh, for soil life, but I totally agree with what Nick said that, um, you know, see what you've got there, put, you know, I would definitely say a new garden, definitely mix in some compost or, you know, and, and put your leaf mulch or straw mulch or whatever kind of other mulch you want and put plants in the ground. That's going to be the key and the worms will find you. Well, on that note, can you talk about how, how often you should amend your soil with compost on an annual basis? Oh yeah, I think that was the very first question. But um, yeah, I, I do it whenever I put new plants in, but if, but if it were like perennials, I, I'd do it once or maybe twice a year, depending on how much compost I had around. Nick, what about you? Yeah, it's a similar thing. I think, uh, you know, a couple times a year, I think would be sufficient. All right, so how do you figure out water movement on a slope? Well, you'd still have to do the same thing. You'd still have to dig, you know, I guess here's the slope and you you dig, the, you'd have to dig the soil, I mean, the, the hole straight down. Um, so it'd be the same principle, but challenging to get there and dig that hole. Um, but yeah, I think it would be pretty much the same way. Alrighty, so this is a very specific question. This wait, wait, hold on, I, Nick, Nick wanted to add, go. Yeah, oh, not go necessarily, to your, uh, just as I'm thinking about, you know, we've had this focus on adding organic material. Everybody should realize that an extremely simple way to add organic material to your soil is simply snip off your plants at the base of the soil when you remove them. You know, years ago, I used to pull out tomatoes and bash the root ball on the soil to get all the roots in, and, and then toss them in the compost. And I don't do that anymore. I cut everything off right at the, um, the base of the soil and those roots will slowly degrade. I mean, it's a great way of adding organic material to your soil. And in fact, it's what happens in nature. Nobody pulls the roots out in nature. Thanks for adding that, Nick. That's good. Okay. So next question is a little specific. So this person has a high percentage of sand and they're asking, um, will adding organic material to the top be sufficient long-term or does it need to be added to a depth of any length? You know, if, if they could mix at least, I would say if it really is that sandy, you know, if you could do six to 12 inches and really till it in the first time. So we want to, and we'll talk more about that next time, but um, you want to uh, do as little disturbance as possible. But when you're starting things up, it is perfectly all right to do some of that big disturbance by, you know, getting as much organic matter, well, not as much as you can, but getting that organic in, in and down, you know, six to 12 inches. Uh, and then after that, just keep adding it to the top and it will work its way down and the plant roots will start getting it down. The worms will start bringing it down and you'll, you'll start having the whole ecosystem working with you. You just have to jumpstart it. All righty. So um, in your opinion, what are the best ingredients to make compost if you were to make it in house? Oh, um, anything you've got and a big variety of it. Um, yeah, I love making compost. Um, so I use whatever I can. So 
if you're familiar with the greens and the browns with the greens you know have a minimum of like three kinds of greens and a minimum of like three kinds of brown so so for the the greens i might do um you know if i could have saved food scraps for a while or you know sometimes i use bakashi and, and ferment them so they can stick around and i'll do plant trimmings and you know and sometimes i'll put like some hay in there or coffee grounds um starbucks and other coffee uh, local coffee shops will often let you have their coffee grounds maybe pete's coffee would too um but anyway most of them are really happy to give you their their, their grounds and those are greens and as far as the browns go um you know fall's coming up it's great you collect your leaves <laughs> so you can have leaves and straw and all those trimmings of dead wood that you've done and um i usually you know put them through some sort of a chipper um or cut, just cut them small depending um but but just the more variety you can get then the more uh diversity of microbes you get and that'll be great for your compost all righty thank you um so what should we do with small stones or pebbles in the soil should they remove it or leave it which one is better i feel like i've been talking a lot i'll happy to take it nick unless you'd like to uh, go ahead, go okay. ahead. <laughs> my first pass is it depends what you're growing <laughs> and how many there are so if you want to grow carrots and you got a lot of stones you better take the time to get those stones out because those roots are going to be really gnarled and you probably want me you might not well i think uh, carrots are pretty interesting when they hit rocks but um but for the most part if you're doing something like that you want your soil to be free of rocks but you know if you're doing something else like i don't know even like tomatoes or something else you know some some rocks in there are going to be okay um, so I think it just depends and it depends how many rocks I mean if it's really overrun and your roots are going to have a terrible time yeah I guess you're going to have to try to get some of those out. Nick do you want to add on. Yeah I think that makes perfect sense it really I, I feel like it will come down to numbers again if they're so predominant that uh, you feel you know it's an impediment impediment to things growing then try to rake them out or screen them out. Um, but otherwise you may just be able to deal with it by amending over time. Okay, so here's a good question. How do you amend the soil around established plants without disturbing them and their roots? So on the top, simply put it on the top. It's, you know, you're, you're doing it like you're doing a mulch and, um, and then water it in. Oops. All right. Um, yeah, so so exactly, you don't want to disturb roots, so you you definitely just have to put it on the top. Um, there are, if you want to do some kind of liquid amendments, there are those. I forget, what I want to say injectors. I, I know they they have them in garden stores, where um, you can actually there's like a big rod and a handle on top and a place where you can you know, screw on whatever your amendment is, like a compost extract or something, and you can actually put that into the soil and then then put liquid down in there. Um, so for a liquid, you could do that. Otherwise, I'd just say on top. Yeah, and a good strategy is what I do sometimes is, you know, you should have mulch covering the ground. Just pull the mulch back around the, the tree or the plant, sprinkle compost, put the mulch back over that will get the organic material uh, you know, to the roots. Alrighty, so next question is about limestone um, and how it affects soil health. Uh, this person has a lot of lime, limestone and sandy soil that they've been trying to improve and they heard that limestone makes soil more acidic. So what should they do? Great question. I really don't know a lot about limestone. Nick, do you? I, I know as much actually as the questioner does. It makes soil more acidic. Okay, um, <laughs> fair. <laughs> so again, I would, I would guess a good strategy would be, you know, to add copious amounts of organic material to try to build up the structure around that. Um, with time, you know, with time, uh, I, well, as you'll learn next uh, session, you know, you could check your soil pH to see if it's outside the range of 
what we would consider um, acceptable for plant growth. And then, you know, just try to amend it. And over time, I think that if it's at an extreme, that will moderate with the addition of organic material. Yeah, compost, um, if you look at compost, is almost in, in the neutral plant growing range. And so when you're adding that to your soil, it does, it helps buffer things and get it back more toward that, you know, middle ground where you want it, where your plants are happiest. All righty. So what causes soil to be hydrophobic? So when, when things really dry out, it's hard for water to infiltrate. So you, you may have find, you can, you know, this happens in potted plants. If things get really dry, uh, you'll water them and it'll just sit on the top. It can happen with compost. Um, if it dries out, um, sufficient, it, you know, it can happen actually with shredded leaves that can form a water barrier if there's not sufficient space for it to moving around. So it's really important um, to make sure that the water you're adding is indeed infiltrating, whether it be a pot or a raised bed, you know, and the best way to, to know that is simply to test, you know, water, use your finger to scratch and make sure that the water is going down and not simply running out over the surface. Because, um, you know, you're absolutely right. When things really dry out, it's hard for water to infiltrate. Nancy? No, I, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, and it's hard, it's hard to wet it up, but you just have to keep trying to wet it slowly, a little at a time, and eventually it will take water. But um, yeah, if, if you're just blindly like letting, if something really dried out and you just blindly put on your automatic irrigation system and you don't look at it, you may not realize that the plants aren't actually getting water. Um, um, and Nick, you mentioned shredded leaves. Um, so the leaves that fall from trees are not um, good mulch cover. Is that is that why you're saying shredded leaves or? Oh, I think they'd be fine. I just, you know, for um, in areas of my yard where I don't necessarily care about aesthetics, um, I don't bother shredding the leaves. It's kind of a pain to be quite honest. But in my vegetable beds, you know, the smaller the piece of the leaf is, the quicker it will um, uh, sort of decompose. So I much prefer that. Uh, and it also depends on the type of leaf you're using. Um, for several years now, I, I have, um, we have sycamores that line the street. And those are big, dry, brown leaves with big um, sort of leaf stems. Uh, and I have Japanese maples, and that's a much finer um, leaf and degrades rapidly. So, you know, you can, it kind of depends on what your starting material is. But absolutely, you know, leaves, as long as you don't actually um, allow them to sort of pack together and make a water resistant layer, um, because that could happen with leaves. Similar things can happen with um, grass clippings. You know, you don't want to make sort of a hydrophobic isn't the word, but water resistant layer. You want to make sure that there's sufficient space for the water to infiltrate into whatever you're adding, whether it be, um, you know, shredded leaves, uh, intact leaves, um, uh, grass clippings. You need to make sure the water infiltrates, infiltrates through it. Okay, well, we're just gonna do a couple more questions and then um, before we conclude here. So this one's actually a really good one. Um, what are your thoughts on adding gypsum to clay soil? So I'll give you my opinion. So I, have, I am a master gardener, but I've done a lot of studying with Dr. Elaine Ingham. And what I've learned a lot from her is yes, it does improve the soil for a short time, and then you have to do it again. It doesn't, it, it doesn't stay there. It's, it's something you'll have to keep adding in order to you know, kind of fluff up your soil. Um, so it would be better to get that structure built and not have to use gypsum. So you know, maybe it would be OK to get it started. Um, but anyway, that, that's what I know over time, that it's not a long-term solution, just a short term. 
Nick, any experience or any studies no, on it? I've never used um, that. Yeah, I've never used it either. Today. So. Yeah, likewise, I we don't really recommend gypsum for soils okay. because yep. for that precise, you know, um, uh, uh, issue that you have to keep on using it. So, and it's not very sustainable in the long run. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a um, couple more questions. Let's just see. Um, so this is a good one too. We live in a wildfire area and have been discouraged from using wood mulch due to the risk. Are there any considerations regarding using rock mulch in terms of soil health and temperature? I have my answers, but I'll let you both go first. Yeah, good. If you've got something, that'd be great. I was gonna say the initial thing, all I can say is, um, yeah, I haven't really done a lot of studying on the fire and wood mulch and stuff. It's just that the, you know, the rocks don't decompose. And I think that, you know, in a desert environment or something, rock mulch would probably be great because that's where those plants are from, but you're not going to be feeding your soil. Um, but it, it, as far as temperature, I, I would imagine the rocks actually protect the soil underneath from temperature. Anyway, that, that's all I got rattling in my head. Nick? I'm going to let can go, go for it. <laughs> Good. I have a feeling she well, knows more. What, than what I'm gonna I think refer, she does too. <laughs> what I'm going to refer um, um, folks to is to watch the firescaping video uh, by Douglas Kent. It's a fantastic, informative firescaping all about landscaping materials and why um, even wood mulch is important and compost is really important in terms of fire and suppress the fire suppressing, um, suppressing the fire and only use sort of rock mulch right around the perimeter of the house, you know, that's right next to the house. But I will, I will let you folks uh, find that resource on our website for that. Um, it's a really fascinating talk with many resources um, within it. So, um, okay, one last question is, there's a whole bunch of questions on um, magnolia leaves, oak leaves, pine needles to be used as mulch. Um, what are your thoughts on using different trees? Um, so, you know needles? what, I find that fascinating. Everybody is always asking about different leaves and, and I think that some trees get a bad rap, <laughs> um, especially like oak trees. I mean, that's what we have all around here, right? Um, and I guess I usually get this more in, in composting and any of them you can compost, they will all degrade, but some are slow. They're very slow. And as Nick said also, um, you know, some of them are thicker or, or bigger and you might need to break them up so water can come in. Um, pine needles, I, I've never had trouble with them. Um, I've used them in compost and I don't know, Nick, any other thoughts on that? Um, not really. I mean, my, my suggestion would be to, you know, try it out. <laughs> Thank and, you. Yeah, see, exactly. You know, see what happens if they go away quickly. And um, it looks like it's a reasonable organic amendment to use, uh, you know, and, and maybe mix things up. Um, you know, having a few different types of, of difficult to um, degrade things may speed things up uh, in, in some manner. So, yeah, and I yeah the best, you're not going to do any damage. Let's put it that way. It's, it's worth trying. Yeah, and I, and I think just what Nick said, as gardeners, you are all researchers and experimenters because, you know, soil is changing all the time, your climate is different for everybody else, and you got to figure out what happens in your own garden, and we can give you like the, the parameters and then work within that, but, you know, take, take a garden bed and try a little of the uh, oak mulch here or the pine needles here and, you know, do, do a little experiment on your own and see what works. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've even, you know, mulch with eucalyptus. I know people are really scared about eucalyptus too, but you know, it's, you can use oak tree leaves are really great mulch for pathways and such too. They're, they do break down any organic matter, matter breaks down over time. So yeah, yeah I've used a lot that. of um, eucalyptus is uh, yeah, is, is mulch and as well as in my compost piles and it works great. Yeah, I wouldn't put it personally on my vegetable beds, but on the other paths or the native gardens, it's okay. Yeah, well, and, and the, the other thing with, um, with eucalyptus or things that have, you know, an odor, uh, you know, chip it up and leave it in a pile. And once that smell goes away, it's, it's really as good as any other mm -hmm. organic yeah. material to use. 
Well, that, that'll do it for today. Thank you so much to the both of you, Nancy and Nick. This is a fabulous class. And we can't wait to see you again next month. <laughs> okay. Two. Thank Alrighty, you. folks. Have a good and one. Thanks for everybody for coming. I, I hope it made sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alrighty.